chapter 4. Does anyone need a Bible? Just raise your hand if you need a Bible. We'd love to get a Bible in your hand if you need a Bible. Okay, I got one hand here. I got one hand back there. I have... Okay, we need at least a couple Bibles. And uh, we're going to continue along the same lines as we have for the last uh, couple of weeks. As the writer of Hebrews is exhorting his readers who are Jewish believers to learn from the past history of their forefathers who failed to enter into God's rest for them. And so what he's doing is he's giving uh, practical uh, encouragement that we can all understand. We can all learn from our past experiences, not only from ourselves personally, what we've learned, but we can learn from others that have gone before us so that we will not make the same mistakes. Now, what was the mistake of the forefathers of these Jewish believers that he's writing to right now? Well, they failed through their disobedience to enter into God's rest. The rest that he promised and, uh, to them, to, his, to their forefathers, but because of disobedience, they failed to enter into this rest. But this rest, the writer says, remains today. It's for every single believer today, for all who will hear his voice and will trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's provision through whom hope and joy and peace and comfort and guidance and protection are all found. They are all found in our uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is the Good Shepherd. So look to Him. Trust Him. Seek Him is what the writer is saying. The idea being He hasn't given up on you. Many times I think we can find ourselves maybe if, if we've gotten ourselves into a situation where we've, we've gotten out of fellowship, we've got our eyes off the Lord, alpha focus, uh, we're not continuing in His Word the way that we should, we, we, get our, we get our focus off and sometimes then when things happen in our lives, we feel like we're out there all alone. And we feel as though God has really, he's not, he really doesn't know what's going on in our life. And what he's saying here is God has not given up on you folks. And he's not given up on us today. So don't give up on him. Do not turn your back on him. And this is dynamic for these Hebrew believers to hear. Because they are being pressured what? To go back to the old way. To the old Jewish system of religion as a way of pleasing God. And he's saying, no, look unto Jesus. So let's look at chapter 4 of Hebrews this morning. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering, into, uh, entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today! After such a long time as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself from his works as God did from his. Let her for be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. And this is the word the Lord for us this morning. Father, we ask that you would bless your word, open our hearts now, encourage us, challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen. Therefore, going back to what he has just really been saying, particularly his argument about Moses not being able to really provide the rest uh, that, uh, that, you know, that God desired for his people, 
He says that Jesus can. He's made this point very clear. Jesus is the one where we will find uh, rest, that rest within. Therefore, since a promise remains, the promise is alive today, he is saying. And this is the living word of God that we read. And so it is, the, the word is alive. And so this promise is alive. Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. God is faithful to his promises. Each one who comes to Christ in faith has equal opportunity to experience the fullness of God's provision and God's protection for their life, spiritually, emotionally, Physically. Now, each one of us, of course, will experience different situations and circumstances in our lives for God to use to be able to show Himself strong on our behalf. Some of you will go through things that others might look at and say, I don't know how they're getting through this. I don't know how they're maintaining in this situation. I could never do that. But the truth is, if you have taken Acts 2.42, which tells us to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, to remain in prayer and fellowship and in the breaking of bread, then whatever God asks of you, I believe that He then will also give you the strength and will sustain you as well. I would like to read a note that I just got from a friend today, this very morning. And I'd written him because I'm getting ready. And, you know, expect to uh, understand that they are going to be honest with you. Because I had one guy, when I said, how you doing? He said, what do you care? You know, and it's like, I had to think, do I care how this guy's really doing? And so I asked my friend how he was doing. He said, howdy, Richie. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm doing so-so. I have these emotional, spiritual highs and lows throughout a week. I have these highs where I believe God will provide me with employment soon because I'm working diligently and networking for a job. I have these lows, though, where I have my doubts if God is even listening to my prayers and hearing my cries. What do, we just, what do we just say? I keep on reciting Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, which says, God hears our prayers, you know, and if we're faithful, you know, to Him, He will, he will answer our prayers. So he says, he does this to assure myself that he is listening to my prayers, to assure myself that I am seeking Him and seeking Him with all my heart. And not only do I seek Him to provide uh, with a job, but also seeking Him of what I might learn from this experience. There's a very key issue right there. Lord, what is it that you will have me to learn through this? So often it's why. Why am I going through this? And we cry and we complain and we murmur and it's like a, a, a whole terrible situation. But he says that I, I want to seek him that I might learn from this experience what God wants to show me. He says, lately I have been reading the Psalms to build my faith. He's in God's word. This is significant. This is so important. I've been reading the Psalms to build my faith and strength in God. I feel David truly expresses in words how I feel when waiting for God to fulfill a need. So I just wanted to read that because so often I think we can lose sight of it to know that God will sustain us. Yeah, he's going through these, these times of difficulty. You know, I, I've known him for a while now, and, 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 and he has been seeking a job, and he's not a lazy person. So I know that he's been seeking a, a place of employment. And God is faithful. And, and I got that out of it. That he, that he recognized and he realized that his strength is going to come in, 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 in God and in his word and fellowshipping with him. And so we too will find God through Jesus Christ. Last week, let me, let me, let me show you the, share this one with you. Nancy and I visited a friend back in Omaha who attended our fellowship years ago. She's a 37-year-old single mom, two boys, eight and four. She's gone through five count them, five surgeries in the last year, is experiencing right now her second round in year of chemotherapy for cancer, and yet she's still maintaining a full-time job. And what's amazing is as Nancy and I were back there visiting with her to encourage her and to talk over, you know, certain situations, you know, the terrific attitude that she has. 
And I'm going to tell you that the only way that she can have an attitude that she has right now today is because she's in fellowship. She's in fellowship with her Lord. She's in fellowship seeking Him. She's in His Word. She's in fellowship with the brethren. She's in prayer. Where many could have become bitter and turned their back on God, wondering, you know, I mean, what's going on, Lord? She, you know, is seeking the Lord and strengthened by Him. She isn't bitter. She hasn't turned her back on God. But she's embraced Him, that He remains steadfast. There is something to Psalm 16, 8, isn't there? And that should be very familiar with us. I think for the last two months I've repeated this verse. As David said, I have set the Lord always before me, therefore I shall not be moved. And that's key. We need to keep Jesus in between us and our problems and our circumstances and the things that trouble our heart. You know, I'm not saying that this person does not lay awake at night crying. I'm not saying that she doesn't lay awake at night wondering about her future here and about her boys and many other things. But there's a certain rest that she has because she has not lost sight of the true focus of her life here and now in Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. This is a famous passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. It's a passage of Scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus is laying down the, the ground rules, basically, for those who, who will be, uh, you know, in his, in his kingdom. You know, how we are to live our lives. And in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first book of the New Testament. Jesus, as he concludes his Sermon on the Mount, concerning all the things that he said, he says, Therefore, whoever hears these saying of mine and does them. Let us not be just hearers of the word only, but let us be doers of the word. Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. Now, Everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. You want stability in life? You want stability as we're living in this world but not of this world as we're moving through? You want stability? You want, you want security? You want you, you, you want to know the protection, you want guidance, you want direction, you want that peace that Paul talks about and the Psalms talk about, where, where, where we're a peace that passes all understanding, then it's building up on the rock, then it's fellowshipping with our Lord, then it's really taking time out for Him on a daily, daily basis. And so there's a rest. What is that rest? that the children of Israel failed to enter into. There's a couple of words in these 11 verses this morning that are used for rest. The word that is generally given in all the times that we read of rest, except for one time, and I'll point that out in a little bit, is the word katapausis. Now, I'm not coming, trying to come off to you as a Greek scholar. That would be the last thing that I would even try and do. But I do find it interesting when we have the same English word used and we have different words in the Greek language. As I go through my study, I look to see, you know, what different words are used. And, and sometimes these, these different uh, wor words in the Greek language have just a little different twist, uh, you know, on what we would use the same English word uh, for. The word here, in its simplest definition, describes the fullness, the, com the fullness of joy and peace and hope and comfort and contentment and assurance to be found in life right now. Now, we live in an unsettled world. I mean, we live in a world that's getting shaken up all, you know, on, on, all, on all kinds of different fronts. Uh, you know, it can be personal things at home, such as I just read about in this one lady uh, and, and my friend, uh, uh, you know, in Texas and, and all. Or we can look at the world situation. We can see, you know, all kinds of things. 
And, and, and as I've spoken before, you know, because of the events that have taken place in our nation, uh, you know, in the last several months, you know, there's a lot of people that are, that are not at peace. And some are even wondering about hope. Uh, you know, they're not really finding contentment and assurance. Moses did not bring these things about, this rest about for Israel. Neither did the law and the prophets. Neither did Aaron and the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system of worship. It was just a continuous over and over the same old things. The rest spoken of here, though, is really, a, is, it's really supernatural in a way. It's supernatural because it really cannot be explained to the natural mind, the natural man. You really cannot understand it. The word means to stop down in place or time. To stop down. To cease from laborious effort. To be inwardly quiet, free from worry. To be settled. To be fixed. To be secure. Now the believer who is trusting in Christ, who is in daily fellowship and communion with Him is not trying to create this rest himself, but rather he has learned to enjoy it. He has learned to enjoy it because of the personal, supernatural relationship that they have with God through his provision, Jesus Christ. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4. It's in the New Testament back at the farm. Philippians chapter 4. When we were studying Colossians, we told you that Paul wrote several of his letters while he was in jail. This is one of them. He's in jail right now. And I would have to say back there in the first century that this jail was not like some of the jails that we have today. It was hard. It was difficult. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, though, at the end of this letter, as Paul is encouraging, he's writing letters to encourage. He's writing letters to encourage those who will read them. He says, not that I speak, verse 11, in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I remember years ago when Nancy and I were uh, separated and, and our, our marriage looked like it was ready to just fall apart. And I was falling apart, to be honest with you. Been a Christian maybe six months, if that. And I remember my counselor as I was talking to him out at Costa Mesa in California, Calvary Chapel. I remember pouring my heart out to him and telling him, oh, if only, you know, this would happen, or if only that would happen, or if only, you know, this was all, you know, in place in my life, that I'd be a happy camper. And he, he told me, Richie, understand. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, this is what, I mean, we need sometimes when we, when we go for counseling, when we want counseling, when we're seeking after someone to really encourage us with God's word, not to tell us exactly, necessarily, what we want to hear, but well, what we need to hear. And, and, he, and he told me, as I told him, you know, about all the things, that if these things were all in place, this would be great. He said, Richie, it's not your career that's going to make you happy. It's not your children who are going to make you happy. It's not your wife that's going to make you happy but it's Jesus Christ and your relationship with Him. Now, I didn't want to hear that. The last thing, I, I, mean, I, I mean, yeah, I want to hear that, but I want to hear also, yeah, my wife can make me happy too, you know, and she does. 
She has, and she, you know, I'm blessed. But those things in and of themselves are not the sustaining things of our life that will really give us that peace and that rest that we also long for. These things that the writer is talking about now are tied together with the fruit of the Spirit. Peace. Fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy. And it's this fruit of the Spirit growing and maturing in our lives because we are in fellowship with God. Because we have made peace with God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But we also not only have peace with God, but this rest is all about the peace of God that passes all understanding that Paul talks about in that prison letter, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And that comes through intimate fellowship and communion with Him and submitting and obeying His Word. Jesus promised in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, because the peace that the world gives is not a lasting peace. We have, you know, our, our Secretary of State, and every Secretary of State that I can remember as long as I've been really interested in, you know, things that are going on in the Middle East, going over to make peace, somehow establish some kind of peace. They'll sign a peace accord, you know, the Arabs and the Jews, and, and there's going to be peace, and not one of them has been successful. Not one of them has been successful. And that's because, really, there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace himself comes to establish his peace when he comes to rule with the rod of iron. And that's the bottom line. But Jesus said, I leave you my peace. Right now, this very moment, I leave you my peace. And you remember in John 14, he was preparing his disciples for the fact of what was going to happen. What was going to happen? He was going to be arrested. He was going to be tried. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be laid in a tomb. He was going to raise, you know, all this was going to be happening, uh, you know, in his life. But he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he wants us to rest. Interestingly, there are two aspects of rest that are summed up in our Selah this morning. See, there's a purpose to the Selahs that are in your bulletin. This morning in your bulletin you found Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. And there is certain peace that we have. We believe God's Word. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will give us rest, salvation, justified by faith. And then he goes on to say, while we're going through this world, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's submission. Submission rest. That's taking what we know, what we believe, what we understand from the Word, what the Holy Spirit has revealed to us, what the Holy Spirit has convicted in our hearts. We take that and it's been applied to our heart and we are able to get through the day-to-day -day things that trouble us or can trouble us, that can throw us off, and there's a certain rest that we have. Uh, it's not anxiousness. There's a quietness and a peace in our heart. So therefore, he says... Once again, since a promise remains of entering his rest, because God is faithful, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now notice the writer joins himself here to other believers. Let us fear. Okay, so he's joining, he's joining himself to them. Let us fear. Those who are believers, those who are holding fast to their faith, though that was once delivered unto them, they are fearing that some might come short of knowing this rest. Because they're pretty troubled right now. They're agitated. They're pressured. They're striving. They don't know what to do. Do we go back to the Levitical system of worship? Do we really trust in the Lord even though, you know, we're having these people say, you don't really believe in Jesus, do you? 
And as Christians, you don't really believe the Bible, do you? You bet we do. You bet we do. It's God's Word. We're hanging on to it for a dear life. But they are fearing lest some will come short of it. Now, this is a legitimate fear that he's making reference to. To believers, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he has not, God has not given us a spirit of bondage, again to fear. I'm pulled out of all of this. But a believer who's weak in their faith, and they're weak in their faith because they are not applying Acts 2.42 that we commented on a while back to their life. And they've lost confidence in the power and the strength and the comfort and the provision of the Lord. And they can fall into a fear of doubt and of discouragement and of lack of trust. So we need to exercise another kind of fear. And that fear is a good fear. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. What is this fear that we... I mean, that's a good fear. That's a good fear. And that fear simply means to respect and honor and be in awe of God. As we remind ourselves daily of His wonderful provisions, do you remind yourselves daily of all that God has done, all that He's doing, and the promises that He's made to you, that He will do, He will follow through on His promises. He will not let you down. And we'll read later on in the book of Hebrews, no, He will not, He will never, 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 never leave us. He will follow through on His promises. As we wait for our Lord's return, we're to be at rest in this world. This rest, as I said before, is a present tense rest. It's now. It's for now. But many fail. Many fail to enjoy it and enter into it. They become victims of the enemy who came, as Jesus said, to rob the believer. He came to rob the believer of this rest and this peace. They're victims of the enemy. Where do we learn about resting in the Lord? I believe that it's during those difficult and trying times in our life. It's not when we're having mountaintop experiences, but it's when we're down in the valley that we really learn about trusting the Lord with all of our heart, leaning not unto our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledging Him so that He, we know He will direct our paths. It's learning on those times that we're in the valley to take life a day at a time. A day at a time. Taking pleasure in the Lord. Taking pleasure in the fellowship of the brethren and finding satisfaction in Jesus who's been crowned king. We sang, we sang that this morning. You know, he's been crowned king in our hearts and our lives. And we want nothing more than to be near him and his people desiring to do his will and to obey his word. Well, maybe it would be easier if we all just went out to some monastery somewhere just hung out and you know there was we didn't have to deal with supposedly the word I mean the, the world God forbid leave all of God's creation and his provisions and things to the heathens to enjoy no he wants us to enjoy them he wants us to enjoy his creation more than the world does he don't want us to go to him. You know, he intends for each one of us to live even as he did among the peoples of the world as a light shining and a beacon in the harbor for lost souls to find their way. Is that how you see your life today? Is that how you see your, your, your life at work? It, it, with, with friends that you have? Do you see your life as a light? For those that you know who are lost... Those that are, are struggling in their life and they have no hope, they have no place to come to, to really take 
and find satisfaction and, and rest and peace for their soul. They're trying to find it in so many different things. Do you see yourself shining in the harbor of the darkness of the fog? You know what, what peace and comfort that must give when a ship is coming in. You know, they, they know they're near and they can hear the bells ringing and they, can, they finally see that light, that, that little beacon light that, that's showing them this is the harbor. Here's where you will be found to be safe. And that's what we as believers want to be a light to help lost souls find their way. Because in Christ, as David said, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 37. This is a good refrigerator scripture. Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto Him. Trust in Him also, and He'll bring it to pass. Now sometimes, folks, we're going to have to do a little, you know, soul searching. Why is my life unsettled? Why am I not resting in the Lord the way that I should be? Why am I struggling? Why am I agitated? Why am I, you know, letting this situation, you know, rip me off? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. I think many times we just don't even know what the desire of our heart is. We don't know what it is. And so we're trying to do it with this. I like this job. I, I like this situation. I like this. I like that. I like going here. I like being, I, you know, it's like, ugh. Delight yourself also in the Lord. I, I just think as I'm reading it, delight yourself also. In addition to <laughs> all these other things that you're delighting yourself, how about the Lord? As believers, He should be first and foremost the one that we're delighting ourselves in taking pleasure in Him. Many of these believers, though, had not come to know this rest. Boy, we just at verse 2. We better hustle. <laughs> For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, the writer says. They all heard the message, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The word preached has to be acted upon with faith. It's simple and clear. It's got to be assimilated. It's got to be appropriated. It's got to be absorbed as nourishment in our lives. If we're to take possession of the provision and the rest that God has promised us, the inheritance in our lives. Now, there are those that hear the gospel, but they shine it on. It has no lasting effect upon their life. For those who believe, it has to be mixed with faith. You know, again, we talk so often about, you know, well, I know God's going to get me to heaven, but I don't know if He's going to get me through this earthly crisis. Oh, oh, He will. He'll get you through it. Promise. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's got to be mixed with faith. It's interesting how the same message goes out. Now, some of you are going to hear the message today, and it's going to, yeah, you're going to step out, and you're going to, it's going to be activated because you've been a little you know, unsure, unsteady, whatever. And, and some, it's just going to be the same old word, you know, about this trust, about this rest. And there's going to be those then that their lives, you can see them start to, re, the, the fruit, peace, growing, maturing in their lives, and others, it's still just going to be wilting on the vine. We've got to take it to heart. How we hear the word. You see, we choose to be on a bummer or rise above it. It's a choice that we make. We can either choose to be on a bummer or we can rise above it. And that's the difference in how some can be going through the most trying circumstance of their life and still be at rest and others are devastated and falling apart. For we, verse 3, who have believed do enter that rest. And that's exactly right. Rest is conditioned on one's response to believe. For we who have believed, exercise faith, obey, you're going to have a good day. Guaranteed. <laughs> Unbelief, it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a real long day, and it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. It's another day of misery, another day of disappointment, another day of discouragement, another day of discontentment. And it can be seen clearly in the lives of the children of Israel who wandered, as we read this morning in our psalm once again from where we're quoted from a lot here, for 40 years. And remember what I told you, Deuteronomy 11, uh, De Deuteronomy 111, I think? It was like what, an 11-day journey. I don't think it was 11. I can't remember what the... It was chapter 1 somewhere, but he 
he makes it, maybe it's four. I don't know. Somebody will tell me and correct me and I don't feel like they're one. I don't remember that verse. <laughs> no. It's, it's an 11-day journey. That's all it was to the promised land. They wandered for 40 years. For 40 years. What is it? What? Yeah, what's the verse? Oh, one, two. Well, I was scooting all around those. But I could have gone somewhere between one and whatever the last verse of that chapter is. 11-day journey. Anyway, God had promised them the promised land. He promised them milk and honey to have a good day. And they said, oh boy. And Moses said, stand back and watch the salvation of the Lord as the Red Sea parted and they, whoosh, they went right through. Awesome. It was by faith though. They took the word and it was by faith and they entered into his rest. But for those who won't believe, look at the rest of verse 3. He has said, so I swore my wrath. They shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Just as sure as those who believe enter into his rest, those who do not believe don't. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Nothing's changed in God's plan. He wants his people to be at rest. He was pleased with his work of creation, and on the seventh day he rested. And that was a symbol, though. Now understand this. That was a symbol of the rest to come in Jesus Christ. He was a, that was a symbol. When he came, then the symbol was no longer necessary. God's rest for the believer is not a once-a-week thing. It's not coming in here and taking shelter in this uh, gymnasium sanctuary, you know, for a couple hours, you know. It's every day. It's in your home, it's at work, it's at school, it's at play. It's at whatever we do. It's not just a once a week thing. It's an everyday experience. When we believe, what is believing? Is it just saying a prayer? What is believing for others? Is it just coming forward at a crusade or acknowledging the pastor's invitation at the end of a service? And those are all well and good, but it's more than that. Those are beginning steps. It's more than that. It's follow through. It's leading a life of commitment. It's leading a life of devotion and discipleship. Verse 4, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. So he, he repeats it. When creation was finished, God was satisfied. He said it's good, and he rested. And those who believe experience the same kind of rest in their every, everyday life in Jesus Christ. As we look forward, not only, you know, as we look forward to the future rest, we have a, a present tense rest right now. It doesn't mean that God, when he rested, he was idle, didn't do anything. No, we're told even in the scripture, uh, John 5, 17 tells us, you know, Jesus said, God's not, he's not, he's just not kicking back doing nothing. He's working even to this day. And he's working even to this day because he's working in the hearts of every one of us here today. I pray he's working in the hearts of every one of us today, especially if we're not entering into that rest that God has for us. He's trying to show us and trying to really get our attention as to how we can enter in to his rest today. And so he's at work He's at work. He has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. In this way, God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. It is good. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter in. Some must enter in. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying, so some didn't. But he said, again, he's designated a certain day. What is that day? Today, if you will hear his voice and not harden your heart. As David said, today, after such a long time as it's been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because God promises, because his promises must be fulfilled, some will indeed enter in to his rest. He purposed it. He provided it, he promised, but only some will enjoy it. And how will they enjoy it? Because they have been obedient to God's word. But disobedience and unbelief will forever discourage others from ever knowing the fullness, the fullness of it. The word goes out, the word is preached, the word is taught, 
The word is offered today if you will hear his voice. Today is the day to begin to experience the rest of God for the rest of your life. This offer is, is still alive. It's forever linked to Jesus Christ, though, isn't it? That's the point that I think we have to really understand. It's linked to, the G, to Jesus Christ. Today, today, if you will enter in, today is the day of opportunity. It's no longer about what happened in your forefathers' situation. It's what's happening in your life today, the decision today. Now the writer makes a contrast, and I'm skipping through this here pretty quickly right now. If Joshua had given them rest, verse 8, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. Joshua, like Moses, like the law and the prophets, like everyone else who had come before, you know, was not able to provide this rest because Joshua was simply a mere man. It's interesting that the word here, Joshua, in the Greek is Jesus, and the, is vice versa. And so it wasn't this Joshua. This Joshua did take the children of Israel into the promised land. But guess what? When he died, they still had not taken possession of the full inheritance that God had promised them. He wasn't able to do it. He was a mere man. But the Joshua who is to come, Jesus Christ, who is God, of whom the prophet spoke, he will provide that rest for everyone who will come to him in faith. And it's intended for us today. It's intended for us believers even on a horizontal level. But before it's going to be experienced on the horizontal level, it has to be experienced in our life in the vertical. vertical. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Now, here in verse 9, we have another word for rest, and it's the only time that it's used in the book of Hebrews. I think it's the only time that it's actually used in the New Testament. It's like a word that the writer needed to make up. How can I really get through to these people? How can I get through so that they understand about the rest that I'm talking about that they will understand. And so it's like he had to make up another word. A word that was more descriptive maybe than catatalsis, which we spoke of before. Because that rest the Israelites didn't really experience. But this rest they will. And this rest is the word sabbatibos. Sabbatimos. It's the Sabbath day rest. Remember, God rested on the seventh day. So he took this word and he made another word for rest that these people that he is writing to would understand as well as us that we would understand. Now this, the Sabbath day that the children of Israel understood was not a rest. I mean, it was not a rest at all. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a time of... How do I want to explain this? It was legalistic. It was doing all the do's and the don'ts that were laid out in the law. Don't walk any further than this. Don't light a candle. Don't do this. Don't carry this. Don't do a bird. Don't, 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 don't. You know, don't do any of that stuff. And so it was not really rest because they were, they were striving just to, <gasps> how many of these can I keep today? You know, and they were burdened down. But this rest is active. And the rest that he's talking about now is just taking pleasure. Taking pleasure in your God. Taking pleasure and resting in Him who rested on the seventh day. Rest in Him. <sighs> so important. The Sabbatismos rest. For he who has entered his rest, back to the same word, catatalsis again, his rest has himself also he, he has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his stop down in this place in time stop down cease from laborious efforts and labors some think that this is well this will all happen Richie when we cross that fine line into eternity, into the sweet by and by. We won't have any more problems. We won't have to, you know, any more difficulties. And if you've heard what I've said today, that's not what this is about. This is about resting now. This is about resting today. This is about being at peace in your heart with God today, even though things may be a little crazy in your life right now, even though the world around you may be a little crazy. You can still find rest. 
You can still know that peace that passes all understanding as you look around and you question. You can be like my friend who said, what, Lord, will you have me to learn through this so that I can be at rest through this, so that I'm not struggling? Is my life truly in the Lord's hands? Is he really the King of kings and Lord of lords of my life? Is he the one in whom I have entrusted my life? The Levitical system of sacrifice and worship was not going to give these, these people rest again. To go back to it would be simply foolishness because it was striving and it was the doo-doo religion that we talk about so often. To me, it's so sad to see others, though, today, even Seventh-day churches. We're thankful for this building that we can meet in today, but, you know, churches that pressure their people to adhere to, listen, to, ritual, to legalistic rituals. They've all been done away with in Christ. They've all been done away with. It's finished, he said. What more needs to be said? It is finished. There's nothing more to be done. No work. Just enjoy. Come to that place of rest, trusting and believing. Enter in to that in your daily walk. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What brings honor and glory to our God? What brings honor and glory to him? It's not striving anymore, but it's surrendering. It's surrendering to him and his will and obeying him in our hearts and our lives. It's not by trying to please him with our own efforts. When do we know that we've ever done enough to please him? When do we ever know? We don't. So what does, he, what does his word say? What, what, what does he require? Believe upon the name of the Son of God. That's what he requires. He believe upon my Son. And we need to strive to obtain, to experience this, which is ours by promise, to come into that place of rest. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, is... You have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? You've got to do works to be saved? No. But we are to strive into entering into the fullness of all that is ours, our inheritance through faith. We don't work to earn that which is a gift. It's a gift of God. Salvation is the free gift of God. In regard to this gift, though, we need to diligently seek to obey God in our lives, exercising our faith. It's a daily walk and a daily experience as we draw near to Him. And every day of our life, there are choices. We'll have them today when we walk out these doors. To either choose to obey Him, something will come up. You watch, something will come up in your life. You can either obey Him, I don't know what it will be, or you can choose to disobey Him. The exhortation here is to make every effort every effort to obey and not to fall into disobedience that will lead to unrest in your life. I hope you're at rest today. But if you're not, I hope that you see that that rest that you're striving for, looking for, trying to create, trying to make, will only be as you take pleasure in your Lord Jesus Christ. He's provided all for us, all of our needs, according to his riches and glory. Amen. Father, as we come to you this morning, maybe there's some are who are weary today, Lord. Weary laboring, God, needlessly. Lord, maybe they got out of fellowship and now they're trying, Lord, to prove to you that they're really worthy to to really be in fellowship with you now. And they're doing so much, trying to... to to show you, Lord, that they are worthy. All you ask, Lord, of any of us is to believe upon the name of the Son of God. Father, I pray that we, God, will experience and know that rest, that sabbatismos rest of just taking pleasure, that inner peace, that inner rest, God. Because we've ceased, Lord, from our own labors, which profit us nothing. 
Father, pour your spirit out upon us, God. And Father, may we even be, if if need be, Lord, as the man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, that we may all enter in, Lord, to your rest. That present rest right now today, even as we look forward to that future rest. And so, Lord, today as we close, we do give an invitation. Lord, we want everyone who walks into these doors to know the gospel. That you, God, so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in you would not perish but would have everlasting life. If any has joined us today who's never come into that personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, who realizes that the striving that you're going through today is because you are a sinner who needs a Savior, Today, you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. You can receive the free gift that he offers through the work of his son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary 2,000 years ago. But you do have to make that acknowledgement in your life. You have to come clean. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us have been born. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The free gift of God, he says. And the wages of sin is is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Will you open your heart to receive him today so that you too might know that peace that passes all understanding in your life that God promises through Christ? If I can pray for anyone this morning, I would just ask that in the quietness of this moment right now, if you've never taken that step of faith, maybe you've attended church a long time, maybe you, you know, seemingly thought a good life would, would be all it takes, I want you to know that you're going to heaven because you believe in the name of the Son of God and you've called upon Him for your salvation to forgive you of your sins. And if I can pray for you today, Will you just lift your head where you're seated this morning and look at me, letting me know that you want me to pray for you? Is there anyone at all this morning? I'm looking around the room this morning. If there's anyone who's joined us today, anyone at all, just make eye contact with me. Father, we humble ourselves before you, thanking you, God. Thanking you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thanking you, Jesus, for the provision, the protection, supplying all of our need according to your riches and glory. Every single need that we have, Father, I pray that we as a body of believers will indeed be at rest because we believe, we trust. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
God just richly bless you guys this week. Thanks for coming. We'll look for you next Sunday. Stick around and fellowship with someone. God bless you. Have a good day and a rest of the week.